um, to come to listen to us. So, um, so we're we're just going to take a few uh, minutes, probably 15 minutes, and um, talk a little bit about Grand Challenges Canada um, and what we we are trying to do, and and really what we see as a big opportunity to be building on our Canada Malaysia relationship and partnership. Um, that, that will have um, hopefully some great benefit to not only health in Malaysia, but also health um, around the world. Um, and so we're going to, I'll talk a little bit about the organization, a little bit about our funding um, opportunities, and then um, most of the time though we would love to um, answer any questions that you have. Um, this is an opportunity to see if you've got two of a relatively small team, um, and so we'd be more than happy to discuss um, anything that you, you would like to talk about um, so that next time one of these opportunities comes up, then you can feel prepared to, uh, to provide us with your great ideas and, and we hope to be able to fund them. Um, so Grand Challenges Canada, um, our, our mandate is essentially to fund um, bold ideas with big impact in global health. And so what this means is that we essentially um, look to invest in, um, in ideas that are coming predominantly from um, countries in developing, or, sorry, from institutions and people in developing countries to overcome key global health barriers. Um, and as you'll see, we do fund some of this as an open, you know, you tell us what, what kind of key barriers you think exist. And some of those we have as directed challenges, targeted challenges against some critical barriers that we've identified um, with the help of a scientific advisory board, International Scientific Advisory Board and our board of directors. Um, we, we do fund some innovators in Canada as well and, and we encourage partnerships, um, not only with Canadians, but from people all over the world. It's essentially just, we just wanna make um, whatever things we invest in have the biggest likelihood to succeed. And so whatever team needs to be put together in order to do that, we really encourage that. Um, we encourage an approach called integrated innovation. Um, and this is a nod to the fact that we see that science and technology um, and innovation in science and technology is extremely important to overcome some of the world's global health challenges. However, it's unlikely to be the only thing that's necessary and that when combined with social innovation and business innovation, we are likely to actually see these, um, these solutions come to scale quickly and have the largest impact possible for, for the people in the world that need them the most. Um, so right from the beginning, even when you say I've got this bold idea, never been tested before, we seek to understand and, and to help you understand what are the barriers to scale and what are the barriers to sustainability and start thinking about that right from the beginning rather than waiting until you've got this amazing, say you've got an amazing drug or an amazing diagnostic technique or things like that and then start ta tackling the, the challenges to either commercializing this or distributing this, um, this scale around the, or this uh, solution around the world. At the end of the day, we're focused on results and we want to see results that are um, to save and improve lives of um, people around the world. And so you can essentially see us as the people who are willing to take a risk on some new ideas um, to, to really have impact, but we will seek to um, very quickly see results from those ideas as soon as, as, soon as they're possible. That doesn't mean that every res everything we invest in is likely to end up working. Um, we understand that, and, and that's partly why we're set up. Um, is to is to tolerate that kind of um, you know we're looking for bold ideas for a reason we think that actually to have transformational change people need to be able to take risks and so that's what we're set up to do we are funded by the Canadian government um, we've had a five year mandate to start um, the Canadian government thought that it would be a good approach to invest a small portion of its foreign aid money into a research and development and innovation. Um, agenda. And so Grand Challenges Canada was essentially created in order to deliver that fund. We are part of a larger kind of ecosystem that's emerging in the world. I'm sure many of you have heard of um, some of the other partners that are, that are listed on this, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. They came out with the Grand Challenges in Global Health about 14 years ago. Um, and USAID has also been a recent um, uh, 
uh, kind of member to the Grand Challenges family, so to speak, around the world. Um, and you can see this entire collection where many of us partner either formally on some of these Grand Challenges, or we are lined and um, can be aware of, of the, different, uh, the different opportunities that are out there and work together in order to um, catalyze change. The idea around this, or the, the nice thing about the Grand Challenges approach, where we identify a very specific barrier we're trying to overcome, is that when multiple partners see that as an, an important um, barrier to overcome, we can combine our resources, we can hopefully make it easier for people who have great ideas around this to know where they're supposed to send that idea, rather than having to chase up multiple different opportunities all around the world. Um, so if you've got questions on any of these, we are definitely going to focus on the ones that are in that Grand Challenges um, area. But if you have questions about the other, um, the other two partners, we do have close links with them and we'd be happy to link you with the right people who can provide you more, more, more information about those. Um, and if you see it on the bottom, there's also a growing movement where this is not just kind of your traditional aid countries that are involved in this. Um, Grand Challenges Brazil was launched last year and they recently had a call for proposals in February. So this is a demonstration of a new kind of emerging economy that is also starting to invest in innovation for development. Um, there's a Grand Challenges India um, that has been created and they have yet to have a formal call for proposals or anything, but this is in the works. And then we're also working with Israel to be um, also uh, pushing forward a, a, a Grand Challenges Israel. I'm going to ask Kristen to come up and to speak to a couple of our programs. Hello everyone and thank you again uh, for joining us today. Uh, so I'm going to start off by talking about two of our four uh, programs that Carly mentioned under Grand Challenges Canada. Um, so as Carly mentioned, we sort of take a two-tiered approach to our programs. Um, our first is uh, the STARS and Global Health program, which um, sort of encompasses our uh, innovator-defined uh, challenges. So essentially what that means is this program allows folks like yourselves to propose ideas, bold ideas in global health, to what you see as being some of the largest barriers to uh, improved health outcomes throughout the world. So for this program, this is our only program at the moment uh, that is currently accepting uh, applications. And as I said, it can really be anything that you see as uh, being a barrier to uh, improved health around the world. And we take a very sort of broad approach to what global health means. So for instance, some of the uh, innovations that have been supported through this program uh, include uh, this photo to uh, your left, uh, top left here, which is from an organization called Soil Haiti. And it's essentially providing uh, sort of a toilet in a box to uh, different folks um, in some of the uh, sort of more informal settlements in uh, Haiti to improve water and sanitation uh, in those areas. Uh, the top right is a gentleman from uh, Canada who was supported to create um, an artificial knee that instead of uh, being something like 2,000 uh, US dollars as some sort of prosthetics are uh, cost. This one uh, he's trying to sort of promote to be uh, $50 or under, and so to have a larger sort of spread um, of folks who can, uh, can afford such an innovation. Um, at the bottom here we have uh, someone from Canada as well, um, who was supported to work with her partners in Bangladesh uh, to improve breast cancer screening among uh, the population uh, in the region that she's working in. Uh, and then we have some folks um, at the sort of bottom right who have created um, a sort of rugged uh, new CD4 uh, diagnostic tool to sort of more adequately test for HIV um, and eventually we'll add on some other types of diagnostics onto this platform. So through this, uh, you can see that we're interested in a broad range of global health issues within this program. And it's really, we have a pipeline of over 200 uh, innovations within this specific program in and of itself that range across sort of this idea of scientific, very uh, technological innovations to ones that are much more sort of social in nature and looking to change sort of more of the social determinants of health that you find. Um, so if you're interested in uh, this program specifically, I encourage you to go to our website and these fun little cards that we gave you 
have uh, our contact information on there as well. Um, the way that our funding uh, is available through this program is we have what's called our Phase 1 grants, which are $100,000 um, over two years, or sorry, uh, 12 months to 18 months. Uh, and then after uh, those folks who have been able to sort of prove their, their bold idea, um, which, you know, as, as Carly said, we take a lot of risks, and so we don't necessarily expect everyone who um, uh, receives funding through this program to be able to move on to sort of additional levels of funding, but if you find that uh, you are ready for that. Um, we have a phase two program, which allows um, people to apply for funding, matched funding, which is up to a million dollars. Um, and so the application is a very sort of quick uh, uh, application and one that we hope is not very burdensome. If you go on our website, it's an online application that's two pages in total. It's essentially uh, what you see here, these five things, sort of what are you attempting to address, um, what is your solution to address this problem, uh, what do you expect the result of your uh, project to be, um, how do you plan to measure that outcome, and then how do you propose to use this integrated innovation approach um, that uh, Carly mentioned in terms of combining sort of science, technology, social and business innovation together. Uh, and we also ask for a two minute sort of short video uh, as well uh, in that. And so the next uh, deadline to apply for this program is at the end of July, July 30th. Um, so you have a little bit of time if you're interested in applying to this program uh, to do so. So the next uh, uh, programs that we'll talk about are what uh, Carly mentioned as our targeted programs. So these focus on sort of really either neglected and or sort of large scale uh, grand challenges in health that um, ourselves uh, through our scientific advisory board as well as our partners have identified as some of the key areas that we can really move progress in, in global health. And so the first here is our Saving Lives at Birth initiative. Um, and this is one where we have a very large partnership. Um, so, uh, the, the, essentially the challenge we're looking to address here is, as you know, um, the onset of labor marks an incredibly high risk period for mom and baby that um, is sort of very detrimental until at least the first 48 hours um, after birth. And within that very sort of short period of time, as you know, over 150,000 women die, um, more than 1.6 uh, neonates die, and more than 1.2 million stillbirths occur. And so together, understanding that we have a lot of uh, the resources or the sort of ideas around how to make progress along um, in maternal child health, but not essentially how to actually deliver that, um, we've come together with uh, four other partners, so the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, USAID, the Government of Norway, and the Department for International Development in the UK to launch this uh, grand challenge called Saving Lives at Birth. And so to give you sort of an idea of some of the things that we've uh, supported through the Saving Lives at Birth grand challenge, uh, you can see sort of flow along uh, this idea of integrated innovation and trying to tackle this challenge of saving lives at birth in a number of different ways. Um, so for instance, uh, through social innovation, we have um, this project based in northern Nigeria um, that's looking to work with the most conservative uh, imams in the area, trying to um, change them from opponents to maternal child health uh, sort of best practices to ones that are, that are champions of this. Um, and these guys have had a lot of success thus far in the sort of behavior change uh, in the area uh, that we know is sort of very important. Um, in terms of business innovation, we have uh, a group in Kenya who has launched uh, a maternal sort of e-voucher program that allows women a transportation subsidy as well as uh, a service subsidy so that when uh, she presents at uh, a clinic she can actually get there and then can afford services because um, as you may know in, in Kenya you have to pay for your maternity care and so this sort of decreases the, the barrier to that. Um, and then uh, sort of on our more science and technology, technological innovation side in this program, um, we have something called the Odon device, which was, it's a fun story, people always like to sort of tell. This is uh, a device that is meant to 
um, assist in prolonged, when women experience prolonged labor, and so is to replace forceps or a vacuum extractor. And so uh, essentially the innovator saw sort of a party trick with a, getting a cork out of a bottle in this sort of suctioned way and created this device um, sort of in that uh, light. And so for these are just to give you some of the ideas as to what sort of things we've uh, funded um, in this portfolio. And again, you can always go to our website and see all of the innovations we've funded overall. Um, so for all of our targeted programs, before I pass it back to Carly, I just want you to, to be aware that we have two sort of funding levels for all of our targeted programs that differ slightly from the STARS in Global Health program. So we have this sort of phase one seed uh, granting level that sort of, you know, you have this idea, but we need to sort of develop it, test it, sort of figure out within a limited setting, would this work? And so for these targeted challenges, um, the funding is um, up to $250,000 uh, for up to two years. And then for folks who have been able to sort of prove in this limited setting that they've either been able to reduce barriers to um, accessing care, healthcare, um, or have actually been able to impact health outcomes, sort of depending on where you are in the innovation stream. Um, we have transition to scale grants, which is essentially sort of beginning to scale up um, the different ideas that come through um, or not uh, our portfolio. And this is uh, a grant of up to $2 million over four years. So to talk about our other two programs, I'll now pass it back to Great, so our second targeted challenge is called Saving Brains. Um, so this is moving beyond the idea of um, ensuring that children are surviving, and um, we've got some really good mechanics, or some really good accountability measures and some MDGs that are focused on um, reducing the mortality of newborns and of um, under fives. But we all recognize that it's not just enough to survive, um, and that development and being able to attain your full, your full potential is extremely important. And one of the most important organs, one could argue, um, that, that would really set, up, set a person up for a prosperous life would be, um, would be the brain. And so protecting, we've really focused this down on early child development, but through the lens of brain development. Um, and that obviously, you know, there's a lot of underlying risk factors um, for brain development. There's over 200 million children every year who are failing to reach their full developmental potential. And, um, and essentially, you're looking at a whole range of risk factors that have also been talked about a lot um, with, in, with respect to survival. You've got nutrition, you've got infection, you've got um, birth complications and pregnancy. Um, issues you've got, um, and then you've also got this other element of the environment, um, the parental uh, interaction with the child, the environmental exposure to things, um, and the exposure to things like um, violence and, and um, stress inducers um, that, that can really set a child on a trajectory to, um, to not achieving what, what they potentially could have um, if given another opportunity. So again, we're really focused on a lot of different um, ways to tackle this, given this is a whole child problem. Um, we see that there's many risk factors underlying this that are going to shift from no matter where that child is in the world. Um, and so we're looking for expertise from these areas um, and, and to see what is the best way to be, to be tackling this. Some examples of the ones that we have been funding to date um, are listed on this page, and uh, I'll just go through them. So on the left, we've got um, from the, from Columbia, the Kangaroo Foundation is essentially assessing um, the kangaroo kangaroo mother care, so skin to skin care um, for low birth weight and preterm infants. Um, they were the, this was the first group to have done a randomized control trial um, of kangaroo mother care with these high risk individual or high risk babies, um, and to see how that actually fared against some of the um, kind of neonatal ICU um, techniques. And they are now looking, following these children up, um, the children are now 18 years old, and they're looking to see how that early exposure to skin-to-skin -to -skin care may have um, influenced their development. Um, now they're able to look at their um, leaving school marks, as well as their entrance into either post-secondary education or the workforce. 
Um, so really giving you this idea of something that happened in a very early stage of life, how that might be actually impacting um, someone's life later on when they're an adult. Um, the second one there is looking at a, a nutritional supplement. So vitamin A deficiency, um, an extremely devastating micronutrient deficiency around the world. Um, there's been some intensive and, and large studies looking at um, you know, how can supplementation um, help this. One of the large studies was um, done in Bangladesh and really put head to head um, the idea of, of um, supplementing pregnant women with vitamin A versus supplementing um, newborns with vitamin A. Um, and they did a combination, so some of the mums, um, some of the babies essentially would be exposed both in utero and after birth, some just in utero, some just after birth, and some were, had none. So they're, now they're looking, these children are eight years old, and they are also looking to see what the effects of that early stimulation, or that early um, uh, supplementation of vitamin A has, has um, had on their development. And then the last one is, um, is a really exciting one where they started with the premise that in Pakistan there's a, a large cadre of, of health workers, these lady health workers, government um, trained and, and deployed across the country that are administering a lot of the um, antenatal and, and early childhood um, medical uh, or healthcare services. Um, but the one thing they're really kind of lacking and, uh, or ignoring in some ways is this important dynamic between the caregiver and, and the child, and, and how much of that we just assume is, um, you know, if you have a baby, then you'll just know what to do with it. Um, but there's a lot of things that, uh, you know, that are not necessarily the most natural thing. Um, how many people know that um, in, in having conversations with your baby very early on, this has been shown to have some tremendous impact on the, on the child's ability to develop language and, and other skills later on. And so this is, um, in some cultures, very counterintuitive. And um, so trying to leverage this lady healthcare worker cadre to start coaching parents, essentially, on some of these simple, um, yet extremely important stimulation and interaction, um, bonding uh, kind of exercises um, is something that this last group has been doing out of the Aga Khan University, um, with some tremendous impact on, um, early, on early child development. The children who initially went through a randomized control trial with this are only four years old at, at the moment, um, but they are going to be assessing um, how this early stimulation potentially had impact on um, enrollment into preschool and really a, a family's behavior around, around a child's kind of trajectory and these other experiences that a child could have as they go forward. The last targeted challenge I'm going to talk about is our global mental health challenge. Um, this is one that has been also largely neglected in the world. Um, it's very exciting to see that there's a thematic focus of this um, within the UNU, IGH, and many areas of the world are recognizing that this is not something that can be ignored. Um, although it tends to fall outside a lot of the other priorities that are on the table at the moment. Um, so we've put a concerted effort towards this, make prioritize this, and again, this is one of our targeted challenges. And really what we, we um, used to define where we wanted to go with this challenge is um, the important paper that came out, the Grand Challenges in, in Global Mental Health paper that came out a few years ago, that defined um, the critical challenges that exist in order to tackle this problem. Um, and two of those were um, essentially increasing access to care um, around mental health and reducing stigma. And so those are the challenges that we've chosen to focus on and, and our funding um, different projects within within different parts of the world to, to do this. So there's a lot of projects um, that are focusing on innovative ways to do task shifting um, in, in countries where there's um, one psychiatrist, a handful of psychiatrists for millions of people. That's clearly not a sustainable model um, when you're seeing that um, large proportions of the population are suffering from mental illness. Um, and so different, different ideas here, I, I always love the, the friendship bench thing, it's a very tangible thing, but essentially they are physically setting up benches outside of healthcare centers, um, and they have a healthcare worker who's been like, just trained on a short period of time on some early um, conversation techniques to pull out um, some, some issues that could arise um, 
screening people for mental health issues. Um, and, and so literally, people who want can go up and sit on the bench and talk to someone. And it seems simple, but it's an interesting thing that's never been kind of put an put a emphasis on in the healthcare setting. And so they're, they're trying this out in Zimbabwe to see how that would work. And then we have another couple examples here. And um, we get a lot of really exciting things around social innovation, working with the community, trying to work with the, um, the cultures and the, and the um, interactions that currently exist and how to leverage those um, to have a, a kind of more healthy mental health community um, in this area. As you can see, our Saving Brains and Global Mental Health, there's a lot of similarities. Um, there's a lot of linkages, both focus on the brain. Um, many of them are, many of the projects we're getting are focused on um, innovative delivery mechanisms for these, um, these different types of, of therapies and treatments. And so I think there's going to be some exciting things that come out of here as well that will be applicable to, um, to other health challenges that exist. So that's our, those are our targeted challenges. I just wanted to end with a little bit of a, of a recap to say that um, while our, our, um, we are only three years old, um, we have started to have some, um, some projects that we're funding in Malaysia, and we hope that this number can go from two to many. Um, and so looking for the people in this room to be, to be going forward with that. But essentially we've got um, one of our Canadian rising stars is actually has an implementation project and some partners um, who are working in, in Malaysia on this. And I'm curious if they're here, actually. We were hoping that they might come, but I've not met them before, so maybe they didn't make it today. Um, and so this is really looking at um, how can you, it's a, it's a physiotherapy for stroke victims, um, how can you take someone through um, kind of arm, arm exercises in order to recover from stroke, and, and that's a proof of concept to see if this, this can be done um, virtually. Um, the other one is under our hypertension thing, which I didn't talk about, but is also a partnership. Um, it was a one-time um, grant challenge, um, which is why I didn't emphasize it. But essentially looking at how do you um, expand um, hypertension treatment um, in the world. And so we have some... Um, so, uh, one project that is um, based in Malaysia and um, one other country um, that's looking at uh, the detection and treatment and control of hypertension. Um, we're also broadly in the region, we have a lot of other projects and this is just some stats to show that we're not completely strangers to this area of the world but at the same time we would love to see that this number goes up. I think there's a lot of potential. Um, in Malaysia and in the surrounding ASEAN region, and so um, would love to encourage us to see more of those ideas, and, um, and if we see more, I can guarantee we'll be funding more. So. And this is a cool little thing that I'm hoping will work, but maybe I'm not going to get it to work. And this is essentially, you know, a sign of our, that's our maple leaf. And here's our grant challenges thing. And so we really do see this as an extension of what the, grant or the Canadian government is, is um, trying to do. But where we see is um, taking a little bit of a different approach is that we really um, value and, and put a lot of priority on the ideas that are actually coming out of the areas of the world that we um, are hoping to, to have impact. Um, we think that those who grow up around these problems are more likely to have um, to propose ideas that are likely to stick. Um, have the right connections to make those scale and, um, and be sustainable. And so we want to do um, as much as we can to enable that um, to happen. And so this is essentially your invitation to see us as a partner and, um, and we hope to see many ideas coming out of folks in, folks in this room. Um, your colleagues, please spread the word and um, we hope that this partnership can grow. And I'm, Kristen and I are happy to take questions now. Um, and otherwise, thank you very much for your time and coming today. Thank you. Yeah, excuse me. Yes. Thank you for the fantastic presentation indeed, because a small idea can be great. I think that's what I have learned. Small things. You take away. But you take away. <laughs> once it is only the innovative and help to save lives, then so we hope that we can uh, participate in this because I'm sure that yes. a lot of people will have this small, small thing, but it is great. Yes. 
Yes. So my, my question is, uh, is there any specific time frame when you, you, you award the uh, grant? Yes. And what, and another thing, and what is the limits of, of uh, grant per project? Sure. And uh, another thing, sorry. No, no worries. Uh, answer all of them after, yeah. And another thing is, is there any specific procedures that, say, for example, I have one idea yes. from my department of my, what is the specific procedure that we can get into touch with you and get sure. things done with the money that you pour to us? <laughs> Sounds great. So I would say, now this was the problem that felt like questions at once. So remind me if I've missed anything. I'm going to start with the last one first. Um, all of our programs and all of our funding go through open calls for proposals. So we will launch calls for proposals um, that are open usually for two to three months at a time, um, during which we have a very defined um, application procedure, all available on our website, which essentially you can find by going to the website that's listed on that card. If you don't have one of these, we've got a lot, so we can grab, we can grab one with the game. Um, so each of these will have slightly different um, questions you have to answer. The STARS and Global Health, as Kristen went through, is a very short application process. You have to answer those five questions and submit a short video. Um, the Saving Lives at Birth, Saving Brains, and Global Mental Health are a little bit longer, but not tremendously. We do try to, essentially, we encourage people to sell their idea in a very concise manner. We have an active process, a conversation after something is selected to get more details and such. Um, and so we try to make all of our application processes as, you know, as, as simple as possible. Nothing is over 10 pages, put it that way. Um, the Stars and Global Health is open twice a year. It is open now until I think it's July, end of July. End of July. Um, it is open again usually around November time every year. So twice a year this opportunity is open. And that's for the $100,000 grants. Um, and then there's also a, a phase two that you have to go through that $100,000 until that phase one before you can get to the phase two. <laughs> for the other three targeted challenges, those are open once a year. They are all open in the early part of the year, so January, February, March is about when you look. We try to open them a little bit earlier, November, December, where we can, um, but that's the time frame you're looking. Um, again, probably the best way to stay up to date about when our funding opportunities are open is to go to our website and there's an opportunity to sign up and enter your email address and then we would um, notify you when new opportunities open up. Um, how many of your questions have I answered? <laughs> Two. Two. What was the last one? Which was your first one, I think? Time frame. The time frame. Two years for the seed grants, three, years for three to four years for transition to scale. So that's for our global mental health, saving brain, saving lives at birth. For STARS and Global Health, it's 12 to 18 months. And all of that would be very detailed. You'd find that on our website as well. But so from the flavor of that, you can see we're looking for things, you know, a very focused question that you're answering. And essentially, that's part of, I think that's probably one of the biggest challenges is within a, a huge scope or a huge challenge you're trying to tackle. Can you define and articulate what the exact thing you're going to do or prove in that two-year time frame, 12-month time frame? Um, and if you can, that is likely to give you a, a really good chance of being funded. Linking it to having impact, what results you're going to have, and how is that actually going to have impact on a population. Um, is also something that is extremely important. And so um, we recognize that a lot of academic institutions um, have some fantastic ideas. Um, I come from a research background myself, and there is some real importance in having research questions for research <coughs> questions' sake. I will warn you that that's not the type of thing we will fund. So it doesn't mean you can't propose them, but you must propose them in the context of how it's a solution how it will lead to a solution, and how it will have an impact. Um, it can't be just a question that will end in a paper being published. Um, that is unlikely to, to go very well, go very far with our, uh, with our reviewers. <coughs>